This is an auto-narrated audiobook by Google's computer-generated AI voices. Wolf's Prize Book 3 in the Brides for Beasts, Wolf series by Candace Ayers and Kim Dillon. Copyright 2023 by Lovestruck Romance, all rights reserved. To ensure these authors are able to bring you more free content, please support them by subscribing to this channel. Chapter 1 I inhale deeply. Ah, the scent of freedom. For the first time in six years, I'm on the outside of the ten-foot-high fence topped with razor wire. The wind tousles my hair as I scan the deserted road, daydreaming of a white limo pulling up Project Runway style and whisking me off to a five-star spa for some much-needed pampering. Right now, freedom smells stale. Like sweat concrete and dashed hopes. I should be happy. I am happy. Kinda. Yippee, I'm finally done serving my time for a crime I didn't commit. I know, everyone claims innocence. In my case it's true. I can't keep standing here sniffing the air, but I have nowhere to go. I clutch my prison-issued bus pass like it's a winning lotto ticket, when the sad truth is, it's a useless piece of cardboard. The bus route ends at the gas station 15 miles from here. Then what? I have no money, no resources, no family, no friends, and no white limo to magically whisk me away. I let out a sigh, and start the depressing half-mile trudge to the bus stop. What I have on my person, the outfit I'm wearing, a cell phone with no charger and a purse containing a mirror, lipstick, a few six-year-old crumpled receipts and a pack of stale gum, are the sum total of my worldly possessions. That's just sad. You're probably wondering about my crime, right? I trusted the wrong guy. My ex Jason aka Mr. Smooth Talker, betrayed my trust in the worst possible way. I didn't have a clue he was a drug dealer, until he left me holding the bag and looking guilty as hell. Yep, I was a patsy. Zero stars. Do not recommend. What can I say? I was naive, no street savvy whatsoever. I grew up in a place that was a cross between a strict religious cult, and a Hallmark movie. You know, the kind where everyone knows everyone's business and they all gather around the table for Sunday dinner with a side of judgment and condemnation. While I endured six years of dodging shivs and swapping cigs for hair gels, the entire Jehovah's Flock community turned their back on me. Including my own parents. Prudence and Gerald Baker declined every collect call from the correctional facility until I finally got the message and stopped calling them altogether. The letter disowning me arrived a week later. Super awesome. Parents of the year. As I shuffle along, mulling over my very limited options, a sleek black sedan pulls up beside me. My first thought is that it's an unmarked cop car. My shoulders hunch involuntarily and I tense, ready to bolt. But the tinted window lowers, and I'm met with the chiseled visage of a distinguished gentleman in a crisp suit. I don't see a badge. Marigold Baker? He asks in a cultured baritone. Is he talking to me? Like an idiot, I look over my shoulder. You know, in case there's another marigold baker behind me or something. There isn't. Ah. Uh, I prefer Mary, if you don't mind. Marigold sounds like a tragic heroine in a Bronte novel. He nods and steps out of the car. He's tall, very tall and good-looking in an important Fortune 500 CEO kind of way. Mary it is then. My name is Aldous von Drago. I have a proposal you may find interesting. This is weird. What is a man in a bespoke suit, Brioni if I'm not mistaken or maybe Armani, doing outside Eagle Hill's correctional facility? Then something even weirder happens. His car drives off leaving him on the deserted sidewalk with me. Although I'm wary, my curiosity is piqued. I flash him a cheeky grin. Let me guess. You're going to tell me I've inherited a vast oil fortune from a long-lost uncle. His lip twitches in amusement. Not exactly. I do, however, represent an organization looking for women who might be interested in a unique opportunity. One that comes with attractive perks. If you're recruiting for a religious community, or are about to tell me how I might be saved if I'm reborn, don't waste your breath. I grew up in a cult, and I can quote the Bible better than you can. The man's jaw ticks. No cults, I assure you. What I propose involves assisting a small private community 
for which you will be compensated generously. Would you care to hear more? I pretend to mull it over, pursing my lips and twisting them to the side while he fights a grin. I guess he knows my social calendar is pretty empty. Which is another way of saying I have no other options. Oh all right, you twisted my arm. I'm all ears. So he gives me the rundown on this so-called opportunity. Apparently, there's a group of guys living way out in the boonies, and they're short on women and need volunteer women to make babies to keep their community going and continue their lineage. And get this, they're werewolves. Wait. What? Werewolves? I ask aloud. Well, they prefer to be called shapeshifters. Wolf shifters to be precise. Let me get this straight. You want me to move to the mountains, hook up with some furry stranger, and pop out a litter of, um, werewolf puppies. You're messing with me, right? I look around for hidden cameras. Am I being punked? Von Drago just smiles indulgently. I assure you, this is no joke. These are honorable individuals seeking female volunteers. Room, board, and a sizable stipend will be provided to any woman selected for the program. This whole thing sounds shady as hell. Yet, oddly enticing. But I've been hoodwinked before. It cost me six years of my life and awarded me the lifelong label of convicted felon. My eyes narrow. Just how many baby daddies are we talking here? I'm not a virgin, but my ex is the only man I've ever been with. You. The thought of Jason makes me shudder in revulsion. Just one. He says mildly, like we're discussing the weather. You'll be assigned to a single male for the program's duration. Ah uh ha. -huh. And how long does this assignment last? Six months to a little over a year, generally, depending on variables. Variables. Right. My bullshit detector is blaring like a foghorn, but honestly, it's not like I've got any more promising offers. Or any offers at all. When you're fresh out of prison with a criminal record, job prospects aren't exactly plentiful. Maybe this crazy werewolf breeding program is just what I need to keep me from living in a cardboard box under the bridge. Desperate times and all that. Despite a few reservations, okay, more than a few, a whole laundry list of reservations, this will give me a new beginning. Exactly how much compensation are we talking? My eyes widen in astonishment when Von Drago quotes me a hefty sum for simply participating, and more money than I've ever dreamed of if I get pregnant and give birth. I mean women do it all the time, right? Egg donors and surrogates. It's a thing. So I shrug and say what the hell, why not? Sign me up, Mr. Von Drago. His pleased smile is mirrored by my own. I'm still a little leery of actually handing over my biological child to be raised by his or her father, but maybe fate is lighting up the way for me here. Showing me a path to a new beginning and a way to get my life back on track. Excellent. Let's get you started with intake. You'll need to be in Timbercrest Village by the full moon where you'll be. He pauses, seeming to search for the right word. Bred by a lucky stud. I offer sarcastically. He winces. Introduced to your program match. I give an airy wave. Tomato, tomato. I don't know what the future holds, but the past sucked and I'm ready to leave it behind. Just as I open my mouth to question Aldous Von Drago about what the intake involves, a helicopter appears above us. I expect it to fly off, but it doesn't. It hovers. When Von Drago raises a hand, the helicopter slowly descends. What? What's that? I have to shout over the wind and dust, the whirling blades kick up. That's our ride, Von Drago says. It's then that I realize the guy was awfully confident I'd say yes. As the helicopter lifts off the ground, I give one last, so long salute to Eagle Hill's correctional facility, using my middle fingers. Both of them. Chapter 2 Raucous laughter and off key singing drift from the crowd gathered around the bonfire and assault my sensitive ears. Not to mention the stench. So many scents mingling turn my stomach. Sweat, ale, and arousal. Yuck. Why did I think venturing this close to the village was a good idea? I already regret it. 
Big gatherings like this make my skin crawl. I'm itching to retreat to the wilderness, back to my den, back to my privacy and solitude. I'm not in wolf form at the moment. Another thing that is uncomfortable and awkward, skin. I feel clumsy and inept walking on two legs. I know what they say about me. That I'm wild, untamed, and savage. A feral beast. They're not lying. I'm tempted to turn around. So tempted. There's only one thing that could have prompted me to leave the quiet of my cave tonight and get this close to other shifters. Her. Even just the thought of leaving without her has my wolf so rattled I have to clench my jaw together to repress the loud howling that wants to burst from my throat. The tantalizing aroma, slightly reminiscent of honey and wild berries that I picked up on the breeze got stronger the closer I ventured into the village. Now, it floats above the other sense and lures me like a siren's call. An irresistible intoxicant. I recognized it instantly the second it wafted into my nostrils. Mate! I tracked the scent here, to the heart of the village. To this gathering. My mate is here. I'm certain of it. Her scent is unmistakable, weaving through all the other unpleasant odors. Hers is sweet and earthy, vibrant and rich. My entire being feels magnetically drawn to her aroma, like a flowering plant stretching toward the warmth of the sun. I have to find the source. I have to lay eyes on my female. The wind shifts and her fragrance hits me anew, more concentrated now. There. On the ceremonial dais, dressed in an ivory gown. Every cell in my body screams out for her. My cock thickens and lengthens, reaching toward her like a divining rod pointing the way. Mine. I must focus. My thoughts are swimming, I'm enchanted, dizzy, as though she has woven a spell around me but I mustn't lose my head. What is going on here? My hackles rise when an elderly man takes her hand in his. How dare he lay hands on my mate? I grind my teeth, holding back a snarl. I have the urge to rip him apart. But he's no threat. He's not a strong virile wolf in his prime like I am. He's more like a doddering grandfather. I scrutinize the second male on the platform with her. Deek. The pack alpha. He is one of the few wolves I am acquainted with in this pack, only because he bothers me a couple of times a year by entering my territory to visit me. Deek is smiling but it doesn't reach his eyes. Interesting. And then it hits me. A memory from long ago. From when I was a pup standing with my parents and older brothers near a bonfire like this one, and watching another couple on the dais. This is a fertility ceremony. This time the sound, a low growl, does escape my throat. That must be what's going on here, but I don't sense desire or possessiveness from Deke regarding my mate. I do feel an unusually high tension from the crowd. The very air feels charged with anticipation. Murmurs reach my ears. Human breeder. Fresh blood. Female pups. Breeder? I don't understand the context, but it doesn't sound favorable. Anger flares in me. Before my mind can process it, a cocky wolf around my age strides forward wearing a shit-eating grin. Challenge, he yells loudly. Challenge. Ah, I see. He aims to win the female's favor through combat. Very well, I'll just have to. Forfeit, he calls out. Wait, why is the alpha backing down so easily? The younger wolf is no match for Deke. What is going on here? Why would a pack alpha forfeit a challenge? And why does this challenger seem more amused than fierce? Puzzling. No time to analyze. This is my opening. I must win my mate. Prove to her that I'm worthy. As the smug wolf saunters toward the dais, bristling with false bravado, I step out of the shadows. My voice. Unused for weeks. Possibly months. Tears from my throat in a gravelly bellow. Challenge. Gas ripple through the crowd. Heads turn to gawk at me. I feel their stares, but my gaze is trained on the beauty looking down at me. Even from this distance, I see curiosity mingled with apprehension on her lovely face. I try to assure her with my eyes not to worry that I am the fiercest and strongest wolf here. Even Deke himself would not win against me. I will fight with all my strength and power to prove I am worthy of my precious mate. Cocky Wolf appears stunned, his jaw loose and a stupid look on his arrogant face. In seconds, my wolf takes over and my muzzle furls into a warning snarl. 
As I rush him, he also transforms. His fighting style is undisciplined. Sloppy. His attempts to counter my attack appear half-hearted at best, and within seconds I take him down, pinning him by the throat. Instead of conceding defeat, he whimpers like a coward for the Alpha to intervene. Pathetic. I release him with a derisive huff, and turn my focus back to my mate, who gives me a shy, tremulous smile that makes my heart thud against my ribcage. She is frightened. I need to comfort and reassure her. The Alpha steps in my path. Has Deke changed his mind? Does he now wish to fight me for her? Very well. I will vanquish the Alpha as well. Rather than adopt a fighting stance, however, he merely studies me. His eyes narrow as though he's assessing me, trying to ascertain my motives. Change back, he growls. So I shift into skin. What are you doing here? Deke blurts before backpedaling. I mean, you're part of the pack. You're always welcome to participate. It's just, you haven't come to the village in 15 years, and now... Deke pauses to rub his forehead. I don't know what he's thinking, but I won her. She's mine. I will fight every male in this crowd if I must, but I will have her. He lets out a long, slow, resigned sigh. You will not hurt her. If you do... I recoil as though he slapped me. Hurt her. I would never... One word escapes my throat, the second word I've uttered in months. Mate. Deke's eyes widen a fraction, and then he nods slowly. I see. He studies me for a few more moments. As I was saying, if you hurt her in any way, I will end you. I will take you down myself. I know what he's saying. He'll kill me if harm comes to her. I respect that, but he needn't worry. I will treasure her, feed her, care for her, and continue to prove my worth as a protector, provider, and mate. Deke looks uncomfortable, but acquiescence simmers in his gaze. He turns to the crowd. He won her fairly, Deke states simply. Unless there's another challenger. Is it my imagination, or does Deke sound hopeful, as though he wishes for a challenger? Several males in the crowd take a step back. That's wise. I will tear them to shreds if they try to intervene. With no further obstacles, I approach the dais where my mate awaits. Chapter 3 This is not at all how I envisioned my first night with the wolf shifters going. When I signed on to be a surrogate, as part of this whole BFB deal, I guess I expected something a little more clinical and businesslike. Maybe meet the future baby daddy, get artificially inseminated in a clinic, be prescribed a few hormone shots, then call it a night. Nope. Here I stand under a full moon next to a raging bonfire dressed like a sacrificial offering. If I'm honest, I love the fact that this night's got all the hallmarks of a pagan ritual, if only because I can picture Jehovah's flock getting a glimpse of this and freaking the F out. The two granny shifters, Ida and Susan, who got me pageant ready were sweet. They treated me kinder than my own kin ever has, fluttering around me like honeybees, complimenting my childbearing hips as they stuffed me into this gauzy white smock. Thanks. Then the grandmas led me outside where I was greeted by the sight of various levels of inebriation, shirtless torsos and enough hungry leers to make my skin crawl right off my skeleton. My anxiety must have been written all over my face because Susan gave my hand a comforting squeeze and told me it was their traditional fertility ritual. Fertility ritual? I hissed, you didn't say anything about a ritual. Ida and Susan exchanged amused glances and ushered me over to a hot, slightly older man with a salt and pepper beard. Then, I'm not exactly sure what happened next. I thought my stud was going to be the guy with the salt and pepper beard, but then he backed off when a second guy, a cute guy around my age, grinned, cracked his knuckles and yelled, Challenge! Then a third voice, this one far deeper with an unsettling animalistic edge called, Challenge! I spotted the newcomer at the same moment the crowd did, based on their collectively horrified gasps. A huge wild beast of a man, his body rippling with muscles, his appearance savage and unkempt. My first instinct was to avert my eyes, but I couldn't look away because, sweet baby llamas, he was stark naked. And not just shirtless either. I'm talking full frontal, bells and whistles on display. Lord help me, I couldn't stop my hedonistic eyes from straying down to his wow. Wow. Then when our gazes met, 
an electric current zapped through me so strongly I felt it all the way to my toes. Before I could dissect that bizarre reaction, Naked Wild Man and the other challenger shifted into wolves and I guess they fought. I couldn't really see around the crowd, but I heard a few snarls, growls, and yelps. It was clear even before the fight began that the jet black wolf, Naked Wild Man's wolf, was the frontrunner. I was right because the brawl only lasted minutes, and then the black wolf let out a victorious howl. Now back in. Ah. Uh, people form. He strides toward me wearing a triumphant grin and nothing else. It finally registers. Oh God. He just won me. I'm his prize. I'm sure there's a perfectly reasonable, non-murdery explanation for why this sculpted god of a naked mountain man wants me. Next thing I know, wild man, or should I call him well-hung man, scoops me into his arms and holds me against his strong firm body. I probably should be terrified. I mean, I've basically just been claimed as a prize by an intense, feral stranger whose body is harder than a diamond cutting tool. Yet for some bizarre reason, I'm not afraid. Perhaps the situation hasn't totally sunk in yet, and my brain is struggling to comprehend this. But I think it has more to do with the way he holds me, not like I'm a piece of meat, a trophy he's won, a thing to be used at his whim, more like a valuable treasure. A treasure made of spun glass. Regardless of the reason I have this odd sense of rightness. Like on some deep primal level, my body recognizes his. A few people skitter back out of our path like he's got rabies. Charming first impression, but again their unease doesn't transfer to me at all. When we pass Ida and Susan, they flash reassuring smiles. Don't worry, Ida calls out. He'll care for you. A little rough around the edges is all. Susan chimes in. Their calm grandmotherly confidence is soothing. Or maybe it's the shelter of arms as big as tree trunks that's soothing. At this point, it's anyone's guess. I'm not sure where we're going, but there seem to be a lot of alarmed looks and worry lines on the faces in the crowd. Wild man's biceps bulge as he carries me through the group who part like the Red Sea to let us pass. Elderly women hastily shove quilt-wrapped bundles onto my lap. I collect three or four until Wild Man emits a menacing growl that makes even the old ladies back off. I expect him to carry me to one of the cabins, but instead, he tromps steadily through the tree line and into the dark woods. Where the hell is he taking me? Chapter 4 She is magnificent, my mate. Her hair is like strands of golden silk. A dusting of freckles peppers her round cheeks and pert nose. Her lips are plump and dark pink, like ripe berries. I want to kiss them, taste them. I want to see them open as she screams her release while I pound into her. I can't wait to get her to my den where I can mount her, lick her sweet juices and pleasure her until she gasps and cries in ecstasy. I will take her to the heights of passion. My desire for her is strong. Overpowering. Just thinking about her body quivering beneath me with anticipation as I make her writhe and moan unrelentingly makes the blood flow to my cock with a raging intensity. My erection is so hard it's difficult to walk. Her lush breasts and perky little nipples poking at the fabric of her dress only make it worse. My wolf is desperate to claim his mate. He knows that only when she wears our mark will the bond between us be complete. Only then will she truly be mine. His muscles are coiled and burning with raw energy. I'll strip this garment off her and claim her the moment we arrive. A primal urge runs through me as I squeeze her closer to my chest. She shivers, and the faint scent of her arousal hangs in the air. I clench my jaw hard to keep from groaning aloud. She's drawn to me. She must know that I am the only one who can fulfill her needs. I belong to her, and she belongs to me. I never thought this day would come, but I finally found my mate. Breeder, they called her. She will be no one's breeder but mine. My queen. Fate has truly blessed me. The moment we enter my den, I will begin fertilizing her womb with my seed. I can't wait to watch her belly swell and grow round with my pup. Three days ago, I was wearing an unflattering orange jumpsuit. An hour later, I was whisked off in a helicopter to something called intake where I was poked, prodded, and thoroughly inspected both physically and psychologically. Now I'm trussed up like a sacrificial offering and being carried off by a feral werewolf. Talk about whiplash. 
As my eyes adjust to the wooded darkness, I study his moonlight-dappled face. Up close his tousled mane of hair frames his chiseled features. Crazy hot. And his body could put professional bodybuilders to shame. I suppose I should at least get properly acquainted with the guy, since we're apparently going to be. I swallow hard when I realize I'm going to be having sex with this guy. This huge savage barbaric hot as hell, extremely well hung guy. I have to admit, the thought has me clenching my thighs together. So, do you have a name? I ask in my politest voice. No answer. He must have a name. What do people call you? Just stoic silence. Maybe he doesn't speak English? Or maybe he doesn't speak at all? No, that can't be right. He yelled out the word challenge. I point to myself. I'm Marigold, but people call me Mary. I raise my eyebrows pointedly as I wait for him to catch on. Nothing. Okay, well, I can't just call you Wild Man forever. How about I give you a name? He looks down at me curiously. I hereby dub you. I tap my chin, mulling it over. Tarzan. Because you're big and fierce and wild like Tarzan. I slash my fingers through the air mimicking claws and growl playfully to demonstrate. His face breaks into a wide grin and oh my heart-stopping goodness. He's even more handsome when he smiles. Finally, in that deep bass voice that makes my insides tingle, he rumbles, Rex. Rex. Okay. We walk for a while, and I keep expecting his arms to get a cramp or something, but he doesn't put me down, so I guess he's okay. As the trees thin out, I can see what looks like a sheer rock face in the far-off distance. We seem to be heading for it. Exhaustion suddenly crashes over me. It's been an overwhelming few days full of new places, new faces, and decidedly new situations. I really hope Rex doesn't expect me to fulfill the first step of my contract tonight. Not that sex with him would be a hardship, or anything. Eventually, exhaustion wins out over the fight to keep my eyes open, and I drift off surrounded by the earthy smells of soil, pine needles, and hot naked man. At some point I awaken groggily, still tired but toasty warm. I feel wonderful. Must be the fresh mountain air. Wait a minute. My lids open a crack, just enough for me to make out some dim shapes. A signal gets through to my foggy brain that I'm buried in a cozy nest of furs. Also, there's a fuzzy warmth pressed along my back. I manage to roll over slightly, and am met with the sight of a ginormous wolf staring back at me with bright golden glowing eyes. I gasp and slap my palm over my racing heart, and then I remember. Rex. It has to be. I mean, what other massive wolf would just happen to be chilling in this? Where am I? I squint into the darkness. A cave? I think I'm in a cave. I must be. The wolf's ears twitch as he cocks his head at me curiously. Wow, he really is a big boy up close. Easily three times larger than a regular gray wolf. His fur is jet black. Majestic, I guess, if you're into the hellhound vibe. He rests his head on my shoulder urging me back to sleep, and maybe it's my fatigue that makes my eyelids feel as though teeny tiny weights are hanging from my lashes. But I think it also might be the feelings that surround me, warmth, comfort, and safety. Yes, I feel safe. I haven't been safe in so many years, I almost forgot what it feels like. With a smile on my face, I curl deeper into the furry companion that's keeping watch over me, and once again succumb to sleep. Chapter 5 The orange-pink hues of early dawn filter through the cave's entrance, gently caressing her sleeping form. Marigold. Mary. My mate. I can't help but be transfixed by the sight of her sleeping peacefully, her soft breaths rhythmic and soothing. My wolf craves to remain curled beside her, but she will awaken soon. The call to hunt, to provide for her, courses through my veins and I respond by rising and padding to the entrance of my den. I must feed my mate. With a cautious glance back at her, I slink away, my paws silent against the dewy earth. As I weave through the towering pines, my nostrils flare, taking in the scents of the forest, scouting for prey. I catch faint whiffs of a squirrel here, and a hare there. But another stronger smell reaches me, one that isn't prey. Another shifter. Fur bristling, I follow the aroma, each step pounding with fury. Who dares invade my territory? a territory that now contains my mate. 
The smell is familiar. Deke. What the fuck is he doing in my neck of the woods? My hackles rise. A low growl rumbles in my chest. Has he changed his mind? Is he here to snatch my Mary away? Over my dead body. Let him try. I'll tear him to pieces. The mere thought elicits a low throaty growl, a warning that I am prepared to fight to the death. Deke appears before me, his hands raised, open palm, non-threatening. Rex, calm your fur. I'm not here to cause trouble. I hesitate, the growl still rippling through me, eyes locked onto his, looking for any sign of deceit. His eyes shine with honesty, but I remain cautious. I just came to chat. Preferably, man to man. He says pointedly, suggesting I shift to skin. I came to help you with your mate. To teach you some things about humans. When I continue to growl, he shakes his head, a smirk playing on his lips. Change Rex. It's not until Deke sits on a fallen log that I give in and shift into skin. He nods at me to sit next to him. I don't. I widen my stance, cross my arms and glare at him instead. Fine. He nods. Lesson 1. Humans like conversations face to face, not face to furry snout. Which is followed closely by lesson 2. Cover your dick. When I scowl he gestures to my junk. Humans aren't as comfortable with nudity as shifters. As a courtesy to your mate, wear some clothing. I grunt, but I'm beginning to realize Deke has truly come here to help me, and perhaps I would benefit from his instruction. And that, he says pointing to me. Your grunts and monosyllabic answers. That can drive a human woman crazy. She'll expect you to communicate, open up to her, talk about your feelings. At my horrified expression, he adds, Well, at least string a few words together rather than simply grunting and growling. She's human, which means she needs you to be civilized once in a while, and subdue your animalistic nature. Be civilized. Subdue my animal. Use words rather than sounds. Anything else? I question, proud of myself for using two words. Deke strokes his short beard. They don't have the same instincts we do, or at least not as strong. So while you know she's your mate, she doesn't know you're hers. I blink at him, horrified. She doesn't know. My Mary can't scent that we're mates. Does she not feel the pull? The unmistakable need? Deke must read the question in my expression because he adds, She undoubtedly feels drawn to you, although it's unclear to what extent. So you can't rely on that. You have to win her affections in other ways. How? When D cocks a brow, I repeat the question. How can I? There. Three words. Okay, lesson three. According to Google, humans like romantic gestures. You need to give her gifts, write her poetry, bring her flowers, that kind of thing. I'm genuinely puzzled. Can't she pick flowers? I ask. Four words. I'm already improving for my Mary. It's the gesture, Rex. Deke waves his hand dramatically, trying to convey the weight of his words. You're showing her you care. Letting her know that you're thinking about her. Thinking about her. Of course I am. I will be thinking of my mate every second of every day. I doubt there will be a moment I won't be thinking about her. One more thing, Deke says, his brow furrowing. And this is the most important. It's about fucking. Let it progress at her pace. Don't rush her. No matter how much the wolf in you wants her, you must be gentle. Don't push her. Don't force her into anything. My eyes narrow and fury pounds through my veins. Is he suggesting I'd force breed my Mary? He raises his hands in a placating gesture. Whoa, easy there. I'm just saying, be aware of her comfort level is all. Let her make the first move. I nod, accepting his words, still a little on edge. Deke stands and dusts off his jeans. Good, he's finally leaving. Oh yeah, one more thing. There's a shindig at Timbercrest Tavern tomorrow. It's a big party for one of the new couples. Bring Mary. My instincts bristle immediately. Why? Because Rex human females are social creatures. She might want to talk to other human females. They like to do that sort of thing, chat, laugh, gossip. I let out a long sigh running a hand through my tangled hair. So much to remember. 
As Deek departs leaving me lost in contemplation, I vow I will do these things. My Mary is worth it. I'll bring her flowers, the whole damn meadow if it will make her happy. But first breakfast. A tasty rabbit should please her. Chapter 6 I open my eyes, stretch my stiff limbs and look around. I'm in a cave but it's not well lit and too dark to see much. There's a stack of soft fur pelts beneath me. I blink a few times. Once my eyes adjust, I'm able to make out what appears to be a pile of ashes and soot. A fire pit. I sit up and scan my surroundings. No bed, no furniture, no running water, no kitchen and no bathroom. Rustic and primitive. Oh boy. Looks like I'm in for some serious wilderness roughing it. I glance around for any other homey touches or personal effects, but the cave is sparse. Hardly five-star accommodations, but it beats prison, I guess. It definitely beats prison. Unfortunately, I'm city-born and raised. Neither Jehovah's Flock nor Eagle Hill's correctional facility prepared me for full-on bare grillless living. I'm beginning to have second thoughts about this whole thing. I mean I knew what I was signing up for, don't get me wrong, but somehow in my mind it wasn't 100% real. Having sex with a stranger and giving birth to his child? On one hand I doubt having sex with Rex will be a hardship, but on the other we don't even know each other. I was too busy being shuffled through intake and then prepped for a fertility ceremony to stop and think, to realize how awkward this whole thing might be. Or maybe you just knew you had no other choice Mary. It's then that it hits me with the force of a ten-ton wrecking ball. The cave is empty. I'm alone. Rex is gone. I'm both a little unsettled and mildly relieved by that. As much as my body seems to stupidly trust him, I need space to emotionally catch up to this insane situation I've found myself in. I rummage through the bundles from the little old ladies first. One is an almost laughably wholesome snack pack, full of fruits, veggies and bread. The other holds some comfy clothing, flannel pajamas, yoga pants, oversized shirts and a pair of leather moccasins. Bless those little old ladies. Quickly, I change out of the gauzy shift dress and into some actual clothes and as I nibble an apple, I arrange the pelts around the fire pit. The morning is brisk and I shiver slightly. I need to make a fire in the cave for warmth because who knows when Rex will return. But first, I really have to pee. With a sigh, I accept that for the immediate future, my toilet is going to need to be a tree or a bush, and I head for the cave opening. Outside, I glance around furtively like I'm about to rob a bank, before I duck behind a nearby pine tree to take care of business. Hey, I'm no Girl Scout but I've been camping before. Once. When I was four. On the way back, I notice a decent-sized rock, about two feet in diameter. It gives me an idea. I manage to roll it into the cave and over to the cold fire pit to use as a makeshift stool, then go back outside to gather some dry sticks, grass and leaves. Unfortunately, my fire building skills leave much to be desired. I try rubbing two sticks together to ignite a fire, but it's harder than I thought. All I succeed in doing is scraping the hell out of my palms and getting debris stuck under my nails. I suck as a wilderness survivalist. Maybe Rex can teach me. Assuming he comes back, that is. A trickle of unease goes through me. He wouldn't leave me here, would he? No, of course not. I don't think so anyway. But where is he? How long has he been gone? My confidence in Rex's imminent return fades fast. The thought of being stranded here terrifies me. I try to convince myself that he fought for me, and that should prove he wouldn't leave me alone in the middle of the wilderness. But what if something dangerous, like a mountain lion, finds the cave while Rex is gone? I drape one of the quilts from a clothing bundle over my shoulders and sit on my stone makeshift chair praying for Rex's return. I'm working myself into a strong panic when the crunch of leaves outside straightens my spine. Please be Rex, please be Rex. Rex's huge black wolf saunters inside, makes eye contact and casually drops something at my feet. I look down. Then I scream scrambling against the wall of the cave in horror. Lying at my feet is a furry bunny rabbit carcass covered in fresh, dripping blood. Chapter 7 The moment Mary screams, my protective instincts flare. 
I shift into skin in an instant, rushing to take her in my arms. Hush, it's all right, I murmur, stroking her hair as she presses her face into my chest. My poor mate must be terrified of rabbits for some odd reason. Doesn't she know they're harmless? Especially when dead. As I rub soothing circles on her back inhaling her sweet scent, my cock hardens and rises. I'm so eager to claim her, I can hardly stand it. It takes all my willpower not to mount her right then and there. I force myself to remember Deke's advice about going slowly with human females. Letting her set the pace. Reluctantly, I step back, putting some distance between our bodies before my urges get the better of me. I'm pleased to see Mary has prepared the fire pit with kindling while I was away. She is a wonderful mate. Smart and capable. She has moved a small boulder next to the fire pit. To use as a seat. It looks uncomfortable. I'll have to find her something softer. I move to the natural stone ledge, along the back wall of the cave that serves as a shelf to store my assorted possessions. The first thing I do is tie a piece of suede around my hips and through my legs as a makeshift loincloth. There. My dick is covered. Although it is still semi-erect and trying its dampest to burst through the soft suede. When I look up to find her watching me, her cheeks grow pink. She is so beautiful. Her plump figure and soft doe eyes make me ache with need. I desperately want to take her, to mount her lush body and hear her moan my name, but no. Deke said to wait, to let her make the first move. Clenching my jaw, I try to ignore my demanding arousal. Come sit, I tell her, then remember to add please. I arrange some furs atop the boulder to cushion it and gently guide her down. I return to the shelf to retrieve the pieces of flint I use as a fire starter, but something else on the shelf catches my eye. My most prized possession. I pick it up and run the beads of stones, crystals, and carved bones through my fingers as I've done so many times. I know it belongs on Mary's wrist. I want her to have this. I take it over and kneel before her. This is for you, I say, tying the ends of the bracelet around her wrist. It is a gift. The bracelet is something I cherish, but not nearly as much as I cherish my Mary. The grateful smile that spreads across her face as she admires the piece of jewelry makes my pulse race. It's beautiful. Thank you, Rex. My heart swells with pride. There's no feeling as good as the feeling of pleasing one's mate. After starting up a hearty fire, I skin and cube the rabbit meat using my knife. Soon I have it cooking over the flickering flames. As I prepare our meal, Mary mumbles incoherently under her breath. I make out a few words. Traumatized. Bugs Bunny and Friends. Circle of Life. Roasting Thumper. As we wait for the meat to cook, it's a struggle not to give in to my urges. In my mind, I'm already stroking her heavy breasts, gripping her lush hips, sliding my cock between her slick folds. No. I force the mental image away, determined to court my mate as Deke advised. When the food is ready, she looks reluctant, but with my insistent prodding, Mary finally nibbles on a piece of rabbit meat. Her eyes go wide. It's delicious, she exclaims. Tastes just like chicken. Again, her delight makes my chest swell with pride. Yes, I have pleased and provided for my female, just as a proper mate should. We eat the simple but hearty meal with our fingers. Once finished, Mary laughs holding up her grease-stained fingers. I don't suppose there's a washroom nearby. I'm momentarily confused. Why doesn't she just lick them clean? But I remember Deke stressing that humans are different. I'm about to grunt and point when I remember. Words. Conversation. There is water nearby, I tell her, taking her hand. We can wash. Seven words. As we reach the freshwater spring, I am once again pleased when my Mary's eyes light up. A place to bathe. I grin wide when she squeals in delight. She kicks off her moccasins and steps into the cool, inviting water. She must love the feel of the water because she lets out another joyful sound as the water swallows her feet and ankles. She moves further into the stream, the water now up to her calves as she proceeds to splash and play like an energetic pup. I stand on the bank just watching her. She is magnificent. I thank the moon goddess for bringing this magnificent creature into my life. She cups her hands together, scoops up some of the water, and splashes her face with it. I can't help but laugh with her when she turns to me, the water running down her cheeks and clinging to her lashes and giggles excitedly. 
Laughter feels strange coming from my belly. I can't remember the last time I laughed. It feels so right being with my mate this way, even without mounting her, which I want to do so badly. By the time we return to the cave, the sun is dipping low on the horizon. I stoke up the fire to ward off the night's chill. My cock digs into this damn uncomfortable loincloth. I want to remove it, but I want to please my mate more. Everything in me wants to ravage her, mount her, and fuck her until she screams. But I won't. I intend to do as Deke advised. Allow her to make the first move. I'll wait. Even if it kills me. Chapter 8 I sit awkwardly on the furs. Rex glances at me briefly now and then, but mostly he keeps his eyes averted. The awkward silence deepens as I pick at a hangnail. Finally, Rex breaks the silence. You are nervous? He's staring at me through narrowed eyes. No. I release a high-pitched laugh. Well, a little. The truth is I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. I mean my role was fully explained to me, get assigned a wolfman, go at it hot and heavy until I get pregnant then be cared for by him until I give birth. My nerves were going haywire so I was only half listening when Susan explained that wolf shifters are possessive, protective and highly sexual, but it doesn't seem as though Rex is going to touch me unless I initiate it. That means I'm going to have to do something very soon. I don't know what I was thinking when I agreed to this. Yes you do, Mary. It was either say yes to BFB or live in a cardboard box under the bridge, remember? I can thank my lucky stars for one thing, Rex is the hottest man I've ever seen in my life. Still, I haven't slept with any man but Jason, and the last time was over six years ago. Then a thought occurs to me. I wonder if his reticence is. Have you ever had sex? I blurt out the question before I have a chance to think about it, and once it's out my cheeks burn as though they're on fire. He looks startled but stares into my eyes without looking away. No. And then I'm struck with the realization. Are you scared? I'm a little surprised when he nods. You are? Why? I don't want to hurt you. He reaches out and runs his finger over the back of my hand, very tenderly and softly. You are fragile. I bite back a laugh. I'm not that fragile. I mean you'd be surprised how much I can take. I think of how he has treated me. He watched over me all night, brought me food, he even gave me a gorgeous bracelet. In the short time we've spent together, he's been kinder to me than Jason ever was during our entire 11-month relationship. My eyes scan his wide muscular chest, his bulging biceps and the bulge between his legs. When Rex lifts my hand to his mouth, kissing my knuckles with tender reverence, I make my move. I surge forward, capturing his lips in a kiss I've been craving for longer than I realized. Rex responds immediately, mouth hot and seeking against mine. He kisses me like a man possessed, but instead of the kiss being sloppy and clumsy as I half expected, his kiss is perfect, as though he's experienced and skilled. My fingers dive into his hair, tugging him closer. Rex suddenly grips my hips, effortlessly lifting me to straddle his lap. The new position aligns our bodies in deliciously intimate ways. I rock my hips and we both groan. Rex's hands span my back, pressing our chest flush together. He nips a trail of kisses down my neck that makes me dizzy with need. Rex, I breathe. This wild man's kiss feels right in a way nothing has before. At his name, Rex's eyes blaze with an intensity that steals my breath. Keeping our gazes locked, he slowly lifts the hem of my shirt. His intent is clear. But he waits for my cue. In answer, I raise my arms and allow him to pull it over my head and toss it aside, exposing my bare torso. I'm not wearing a bra, and his glowing eyes drink in my naked breasts and stomach with wordless reverence. The heat in his gaze speaks louder than words ever could. Desire coils hot and heavy in my core. I've never felt more beautiful than I do under Rex's worshipful stare. He dips his head to press a line of scorching kisses along my collarbone and down between my breasts. I tip my head back, arching into his touch. When his tongue swirls languidly around one nipple, I gasp, threading my fingers into his long hair to pull him closer. Rex lets out a possessive rumble against my skin that I feel down to my toes. He lavishes the same attention on my other aching nipple, until I'm mindless with need, rocking my hips restlessly, urgently seeking friction. Sensing my desperation, Rex grasps my hips and lifts me. 
in one smooth motion he lays me back on the plush furs. I immediately miss his warmth. But not for long. His strong body stretches out above me. Hands planted on either side of my head, he cages me in with the hard lines of his honed body. We're flush together from chest to hips. Skin against skin. The contact already has my pulse galloping, but Rex isn't rushing this. He holds my gaze, the questions clear in his simmering amber eyes. Is this what you want? Am I doing this right? Yes, I whisper, running my palms up his powerful arms. When Rex seals his mouth over mine, there's an undercurrent of relief, a letting go of reservations. Like we've both been waiting desperately for this moment, which is crazy since we've only just met but… But it honestly feels as though I've been waiting for this man my whole life. I crave him with every cell in my body. The craving is a palpable force, threatening to consume us both. As our tongues tangle in a sensuous give and take, Rex's calloused hands roam my heated flesh leaving goosebumps in their wake. Down my sides along my thighs. Like a man mapping every inch of newly discovered territory. When he covers my breasts, kneading the sensitive mounds, I gasp into his mouth. His hesitance is gone. His touch is rough yet fervent. Fine. His gruff voice utters. Maybe that should rattle my feminist ideals, but instead it fills an empty ache inside I didn't know was there. Rex nips, licks and kisses down my quivering stomach. When he reaches the low waistband of my yoga pants, I lift my hips eagerly, helping him strip the last of my clothing away until I'm fully bare before him. Rather than surge forward to take me, he simply looks. His eyes roam every curve and valley, missing nothing. A fresh blush warms my cheeks at being so thoroughly exposed, but the shyness dissolves under the blaze of raw hunger in his gaze. Beneath that hunger smolders something more profound. Adoration. Protectiveness. Traces of disbelief. Like he can't fathom how he got so lucky. His raw, unguarded expression with so much power and emotion steals my breath and stings my eyes. When a callous fingertip traces my hip bone with aching tenderness, I tremble. What is happening? It's not supposed to be like this between us. This is a job. A duty. A contract. Feelings aren't supposed to be attached. They will only complicate things and make this a hundred times more difficult, yet how can I help it? I've never felt so cherished. Rex's touch drifts lower, stroking through my neatly trimmed curls. I hold my breath, my body thrumming with anticipation. When his head bends and his tongue darts out swiping between my slick folds, I arch sharply off the furs. Oh. Jason never went down on me, so this is a first for me. My strangled cry seems to spur Rex on. He strokes his tongue along my seam before circling the aching bud of my clit with maddening pressure. I writhe beneath him, chasing the friction my body craves. But he keeps his pace languid, taking his time watching my expression attentively as though he's learning what makes me sigh and twitch. Only when I'm nearly delirious, hips bucking shamelessly against his hand, does Rex relent. He parts my slick folds and sinks one long finger into my entrance. I cry out at the exquisite stretch, clutching his shoulders desperately. Rex works his finger in and out, tongue still strumming my swollen clit in tight circles. When he adds a second finger, curving them to graze that magical spot inside me, the pleasure crests sharply. Rex? I cry his name like a benediction as my climax crashes over me. No one has ever played my body so skillfully. As I come back down, Rex strokes me through the last fiery tremors, peppering my tear-dampened face with tender kisses. Wait. Tear-dampened? I'm crying? Oh my god. I wipe my eyes frantically, trying to hide my emotion. When he draws back to pour over me, I can't decipher his conflicted expression. It almost looks as though lust and restraint are warring for dominance. With a pained hiss through clenched teeth, Rex rolls away to sit on the edge of our fur nest. Bewildered, I push up onto my elbows. My sated limbs still feel languid and loose. A muscle in Rex's jaw ticks. He keeps his heated gaze averted like looking at my nude form is painful. What's wrong? I pant. When he looks at me, his face is contorted in pain. He brushes a tear away with his thumb, and the agony in his eyes nearly guts me. I hurt you. Chapter 9 No. The tears aren't from pain. They're from? My voice trails off. 
How do I tell him I'm overwhelmed with emotion, that I'm completely smitten by him? I can't tell him that. It doesn't even make sense to me. How can I have already fallen for this man I just met? It's impossible, right? Well, Mary, you do have a history of being stupid and naive. As I struggle to come up with a reply, he turns away from me, his shoulders hunched. My heart squeezes painfully. I sit up and slide my arms around him from behind, pressing my cheek between his shoulder blades. Tension thrums through his coiled body, but he relaxes minutely at my touch. You didn't. Just trust me on this, Rex. I've never felt so good before in my life. You didn't hurt me. Not at all. Placing a kiss on his taut shoulder, I whisper, and we're not done. I trail my fingers down his stomach and over the bulge in his loincloth. He sucks in a sharp breath, every muscle in his body going rigid. I guess that's the sign he was waiting for because, in one smooth move, Rex turns and pulls me tightly against his body. Our mouths meet in a fervent kiss. I can feel him brimming with barely restrained need. My head spins from lack of air, but I can't bring myself to break contact. Not even to breathe. He pushes me back on the furs. Holding my gaze, he tears off his loincloth exposing his huge, rigid cock. I want this man so bad. I want to feel him inside me. He doesn't make me wait long before the blunt head of his erection nudges my entrance, and we both shiver. Rex's eyes glow lava bright, and his expression though eager is tentative. Are you sure? He grates out. In answer I grasp his hips, pull him down and arch to meet him. We both groan as his hard length glides through my slick folds. Bracing above me, Rex steals another breathless kiss. Then with a gradual steady pressure, he enters me inch by glorious inch. We're locked together, barely able to draw air. Nothing has ever felt so right and perfect to me as having him buried deep inside me, our bodies connected. Once fully sheathed, Rex pauses, muscles quivering with restraint. His fingers trace my cheek reverently as though he can't believe I'm real. When I wrap my legs around his hips, he takes the hint and starts to move with long deep strokes that hit just the right spot inside me. I rise to meet each thrust, our bodies tuned to one another. Harder, I urge. I promise you won't hurt me. As intimacy gives way to urgency, Rex's powerful body thrusts into me tirelessly and with purpose. His thick length plunges into my welcoming heat again and again. I clutch his shoulders, sure I'll shatter any moment but Rex seems determined to make this last. Just when I near the precipice, he slows his pace and steals me back from the edge with deep kisses. It's really hard to believe he's never done this before. We move together slowly, languidly, hands roaming and caressing. Each smoldering peak leaves me trembling, ready and eager for the next, until I'm lost to anything beyond this bed of furs. Beyond Rex worshipping my body, and chasing away all my cares and worries and past woes. When Rex finally stops holding back, his driving hips take me higher than I've ever been. Our bodies work toward a single shared purpose. Ecstasy. Let go. Rex urges in my ear. Scream for me again. His gravelly voice is my undoing. My climax crashes over me with the force of a tidal wave, rippling through my entire body. Rex's hips piston erratically as he finds his own thunderous release. I cling to him through our shared aftershocks, the only anchor in my blissful sea of sensation. We remain joined even as our bodies gradually still, hearts thundering in tandem. He doesn't let go of me, not even when he rolls to the side. He simply gathers me close and pulls me into him. We bask in the warm afterglow, trading lazy caresses. Eventually, I prop my chin on his chest to peer at him. His handsome features are relaxed, and his eyes still glowing are tender as they take me in. I'm suddenly a little afraid. I know what I'm here to do, but this man is changing everything. It's as though he touches me somewhere deep inside, bypassing all my defenses and pretenses and we connect at a soul-deep level. And I'm supposed to carry his child, give birth and leave? How in the world am I going to manage that? Chapter 10 the trees thin as we near the outskirts of the village. I can already smell the stench of too many bodies crowded together. My nose wrinkles in disgust. I have no desire to mingle with the others, to make small talk, or participate in their revelries. A low rumble vibrates in my chest. Mary glances up at me, one delicate brow arched. 
She tugs on my arm until I stop walking to face her, then tilts her head studying me with a small knowing smile. That's the third time you've growled in the past half mile. What's on your mind, grumpy wolf? I grunt. Irritation at myself churns my gut. I didn't realize my displeasure was so evident. When I remain silent, jaw clenched, she says, We don't have to go, you know. We can turn around right now. I frown down at her. No, we can't turn around. We must attend. I promise Deke. It is expected. But even more, I know Mary will enjoy being around others. My own preferences are unimportant. I'll ignore my discomfort for her benefit. Her expression softens. She reaches up to cup my jaw tenderly. Despite my inner turmoil, I lean into her touch, savoring her gentle caress. No one has touched me with such tenderness in longer than I can recall. Rex, I want you to promise you'll try to enjoy yourself. I know you prefer your solitude, but please just try. I nod, grasping her delicate hand in mine and bringing it to my lips. The intoxicating sweetness of her skin makes my heart clench. I will enjoy myself, I state firmly. I am happy to go. The lie feels clumsy on my tongue. Mary tips back her head and laughs, the sound bright and melodic like birdsong after a storm. Oh, now that was convincing, she teases. Despite myself, I chuckle. Mary's playful nature feels like the sun when it breaks through the clouds. I lace my fingers through hers, brushing a kiss over her knuckles. I am happy because you are, I amend truthfully. As long as my mate is content, nothing else matters. Not the crowd, not the annoying chatter. Only my Mary. Her answering smile warms me to my core. She lifts on her toes to brush a feather-like kiss to my lips that steals my breath. When she sinks back down, pink tinging her cheeks, I fight back a groan. I want her again. Now. My body stirs to life, hardening with need. I crave her constantly. The mating bond tugs at me, intense and demanding. But I rein in the urge. There will be time enough for that later. For now, I hoist her into my arms and continue toward the village. She gives a startled squeak at being swept off her feet. Rex, you don't have to carry me. I merely grunt in response, securing her tighter against my chest, relishing her warmth and closeness. Her melodic laugh tells me she doesn't truly mind. We continue in comfortable silence. I love holding my mate protectively in my arms. Mine to shelter and comfort. I wonder if she knows she provides me with comfort as well. As we near the edge of Timbercrest Village, despite my resolve, tension winds through me. Too many scents, too many sounds. I yearn to turn and flee into the quiet solace of the woods. Only when the village comes into view through the trees do I reluctantly set her down. I slide my hand into hers, relishing the press of her soft palm against my rough one. We make our way down the row of neatly clustered log cabins. As we approach the log structure ahead, the tavern, the scent of ale and food cooking greets us. And shifters. So many mingled scents. I tense, my lip curling reflexively. Mary gives my hand a reassuring squeeze. I square my shoulders and enter the tavern behind her. Immediately, the loud chatter ceases. Every face swivels our way, conversations trailing off. Their attention feels like insects skittering over my skin. A threatening rumble builds in my chest, but Mary remains relaxed at my side. Hi, everyone, she chirps brightly. I marvel at her poise and grace while I remain a glowering, hulking shadow at her back. A tall, red-haired woman detaches from a group nearby and approaches Mary, clasping her hands. I'm surprised when I scent that she's a wolf shifter. You must be Mary. I'm so pleased to finally meet you. I'm Marla. She smiles at Mary, and then looks over Mary's shoulder at me. And you're Rex. I'm so glad you joined us tonight. I offer Marla a curt nod. Her acceptance helps settle my wolf somewhat. She poses no threat. We're celebrating Jeannie and Zeb's mating. Marla continues. This is my mate Asa. A large wolf shifter joins us and my hackles rise. I'm not sure I should trust him. But he nods at me and smiles. He seems friendly, but I don't know. Come on, Marla says to my mate. I'll introduce you to Jeannie. You'll love her. Chatter gradually resumes around the tavern, but I experience a quick tinge of panic as Marla leads Mary away. 
My inner wolf paces and huffs just beneath my skin, uneasy surrounded by perceived threats. He does not understand the rules of societal niceties. He only recognizes what is his to protect and provide for. I vaguely recognize faces, faces I have not looked upon in years. But no names come to mind. I've remained secluded from the pack for so long that these wolves are strangers to me. Asa clearly senses my discomfort because he leans in and speaks low enough that only I can hear him. Don't let anyone rile you tonight. There are no foes here, only friends. Only friends. I fold my arms over my chest and try to project an air of calm despite my distaste for crowds. Deke appears suddenly, slapping my shoulder. Rex, you made it. I offer him a stiff nod and suppress a groan. Here we go. Socialization. For my mate's happiness, I remind myself. Chapter 11 Marla links her arm through mine. Genie's human like you. Oh. I guess that means Marla's not. Is she a shifter too? As we weave through the crowd, I notice a huge scar on Marla's neck. I wonder what happened to cause that. When we reach a woman around my age nibbling on a huge slice of chocolate cake, Marla announces, Jeannie, this is Mary. The new human resident. Jeannie gives me an excited once over. So you're the new babe. It's nice to meet you. I'm Jeannie. Babe? I questioned confused. Oh, that's what I call the Brides for Beasts participants, Babes for Breeding, Jeannie says with an eye roll. I was last month's babe. I guess it's pretty accurate, I say with a laugh. So you were part of the program too? Prison taught me to have a sixth sense about people, and I like Jeannie instantly. She seems down to earth and not pretentious at all, but my eyes are drawn to the scar on her neck, in the same spot as Marla's only unlike Marla's, Jeannie's is still pink and fresh. Jeannie nods. Yup. I was assigned to Zeb, but we really hit it off. Now well, this is our mating party. Mating? I question. The way she says it implies something more than just a hookup. It's the wolf shifter equivalent of a Vegas wedding, Marla explains. Only no Elvis impersonator and mating is for life. There's no divorce in shifterland. Oh, interesting. I glance around for Rex and when I spot him, warmth spreads through me at the sight. I feel a fluttering behind my breastbone. He's with a group of guys who are deep in conversation, and he's smiling. Rex is actually smiling. He looks so at ease now, as though he fits in, even if he's the only one wearing a loincloth. Seeing him integrate back into the pack warms my heart. This is where he belongs. So how are things going with you and Rex? Marla recaptures my attention, waggling her brows suggestively. I can't hold back a grin. Just the mention of his name sends a thrill through my veins. Really good. I sigh dreamily. Too good. So good it scares me a little. Marla presses her lips together, mulling it over. Well, I don't like to gossip. Jeannie snorts out a laugh. You're the biggest gossip in the village, Marla. All right, fine. Marla laughs. Maybe I do indulge in some tea spilling now and again but it comes from a place of love. She pats my hand affectionately. Did Rex ever tell you what happened to make him shun the pack and live as a recluse out in the wilderness? No. My throat tightens. What happened? Marla motions for both of us to come closer and lowers her voice to a near whisper. Rex lost his entire family when he was just a boy. When I inhale sharply, she nods. There was a horrible landslide and several of the pack members lost loved ones. My mate Asa lost both his parents and I lost a father I never met. From what I hear, it devastated the pack. Marla pauses for a moment to give the topic the respect it deserves. Rex was just a pup and lost his whole family, both parents and his three older brothers. I gasp and blink back tears, picturing a young grieving Rex mourning his loved ones. My heart squeezes. He took it hard, Marla continues. Wouldn't come out of wolf form for years. Stayed away from the pack, too. He kept straying farther and farther from the village. Just ran wild in the mountains. Until he found you, Jeannie adds with an encouraging smile. I force a tight smile, lost in thought as I absorb this new insight into Rex and contemplate the depth of his pain after enduring such tragedy. 
I watch Rex throw his head back and laugh. It explains his tenseness when we were traveling here tonight. I love that he looks so carefree right now. I love how his eyes light up as he listens to one of the guys. I love him. Oh my word, I love him. My breath hitches as the truth hits me fully, almost knocking the wind from my lungs. I love Rex. I must have tuned out for a minute because when I again focus, Jeannie is fanning herself. After mating, the sex is something fierce. Mating heat is intense. We go at it like bunnies. My cheeks flame red at her bluntness, but I have to admit, the idea sends a little thrill through me. With the insane chemistry between Rex and me, I wonder how it would feel to be Rex's wife or mate, whatever they call it. I don't hate the idea. Maybe the next mating party will be ours. So now you're like, official? I question. Jeannie nods, beaming. She tilts her head, displaying the nasty scar on her neck with pride. I'm a little shocked. Um. That looks painful. What happened? Marla and Jeannie exchange looks. You don't know about claiming marks? She looks surprised. When a shifter claims their mate, they mark them like this, with a bite. Marla jumps in pointing to her own scar. It means we're mated. It's the shifter equivalent of a wedding ring. But this is permanent. There's no such thing as shifter divorce. Jeannie chuckles, rolling her eyes. Anyone with one of these is shifter married. Shackled for life. Not that I'm complaining. Oh wow. I reply, and you've only been here a month? That's fast. Nope. Not for shifters, Marla says and Jeannie nods. Shifters know instantly. They don't need to go on dates and test compatibility. They just know. Jeannie is grinning like a Cheshire cat. My hand goes to my own unmarked neck. Briefly, I wonder what it would be like to have Rex's claiming bite. My heart stutters at the thought. As I ponder that, my gaze lands on the scarred marks again. Marla and Jeannie are smiling and laughing. That's why they use the term faded mate, Jeannie says. Mates are somehow ordained by the moon goddess herself, or something. I don't know about all that, but I do know when a shifter encounters their mate, it's like being struck by lightning. There's no denying it. It's true, Marla pipes up. There's only one person in the world for each shifter. Some never find their fated mate, but those of us who do are truly blessed by the moon goddess. The implication hits me like a blow. Rex could have a true mate out there. A fated mate. And I'm just the woman keeping his bed warm and birthing his pups until she shows up. The thought makes my stomach twist painfully. Sensing my mood swing, Marla touches my arm. What's wrong, hon? I open my mouth but emotions clog my throat. I swallow thickly. It's just... I force a brittle laugh. And make an excuse to slip away. I need the ladies' room. What I really need is some space. Some air. Some distance. I push down the knot of emotion swelling in my throat, and practically run to the ladies' room near the back. But when I get there, I see an exit door. I head for that instead. Chapter 12 This was supposed to be simple. An arrangement that benefited us both. Rex needed a breeder. I needed a fresh start. But now, now I've gone and done the stupidest thing imaginable, I've let myself fall for him. Which means I need to guard my heart. If I'm not Rex's fated mate, that makes me temporary. A means to an end. I won't be shattered again when he discards me. When he finds his true mate and I'm left out in the cold once more. Memories I've tried so hard to bury rush through my brain. My parents turning their backs on me. Friends shunning me. Every person I ever cared about, cutting me out of their lives in one devastating blow. The pain of total abandonment almost destroyed me once before. I can't go through that again. I won't survive it a second time. As I step outside into the cool night air, I scrub a hand over my damp eyes. Get it together, Mary. I just need a minute to rein in my emotions. I'll paste on a smile and get back to the party while I figure out my exit strategy. Before I can pull myself together, the tavern door swings open. Rex bursts out, his brow furrowed. He inhales deeply, 
no doubt scenting the anxiety and sadness rolling off me. Rex crosses the distance between us in three long strides. What's wrong, my Mary? At his tender concern, my tenuous composure shatters completely. I press my face into his solid chest as a sob escapes. Rex hugs me close, one hand cradling the back of my head. Tell me, he urges. Who hurt you? I will kill them, I promise. I cling tighter, breathing in his woodsy scent. The solid strength of him surrounds me, keeping me tethered during the emotional storm swirling inside me. Finally, I find my voice. It's stupid. I force an unsteady laugh. Ignore me. Mood swings are something. Rex pulls back, keeping me caged in his strong arms. His glowing eyes see straight through me. Straight through to the heart of my doubts and fears. Not stupid. He rumbles. With a knuckle under my chin, Rex tips my face up, peering deep into my eyes. Tell me the truth. His quiet intensity makes more tears spill over. I swipe at them in frustration. I just... My voice hitches. I try again. Marla and Jeannie told me about. I breathe out a frustrated breath. About shifters having faded mates. Fresh tears cut off my words. Rex's expression softens. He brushes the moisture from my cheeks with aching tenderness. Yes. He says simply. I nod, sniffling. She also mentioned mate claiming marks and it hit me suddenly. I lift my eyes to his. What if I'm keeping you from finding your true mate? Your fated mate could be out there waiting for you. Rex stills. For a moment he just searches my face through slightly widened eyes. Then he crushes me tightly against his chest once more, and dips his head until his lips brush the shell of my ear. You are not keeping me from my fated mate. You are my fated mate. My marigold. My one and only. Rex pulls back, eyes blazing with conviction. I knew at the moment I scented you. Nothing has ever felt more right and true than you in my arms. But? I wet my lips uncertainly. You never marked me. Rex winces. I hope to prove myself first. To prove myself worthy of you. Worthy? I bark an incredulous laugh. Rex, you're everything I could ever dream of. I cradle his jaw, tenderness swelling in my chest until I can barely contain it. I'm the one who's not worthy of you, I whisper. Rex makes a rough sound low in his throat. In the next instant, his mouth claims mine in a blistering kiss that turns my knees to jello. I cling to his shoulders just to remain upright. He walks me backward until my back meets the exterior wall of the tavern. Rex pins me there with his hulking frame, still devouring my lips like he can't get enough. Like he wants to consume me. Arousal tightens my core. I rock my hips against his muscular thigh to gain some friction. Rex groans into my mouth. The hard ridge of his erection presses into my hip insistently. I'm lost, drowning in this man. In the passion flaring hot between us. Nothing matters beyond having him and being completely his. Rex tears his lips from mine. We're both panting raggedly. Keeping my gaze locked with his, he trails a hand down to grip my hip tightly. Mine. He growls. A whimper escapes me. Yes. Yours. With a low snarl, Rex seals his open mouth over the tender spot where my neck meets my shoulder. He scrapes his teeth over the sensitive skin. Positioning. And then he pulls away. My heart sinks. You don't want to. I ASSK crushed. You don't want to make me yours? I do, Mary. More than anything. But not like this. I want it to be special for you. With flowers. Deke said human females like flowers. A small giggle bubbles up from my chest. We do. He wants to make it special for me. He doesn't know that every moment I spend with him is special to me. I stroke the bracelet on my wrist, his gift to me. I've had a chance to examine it more carefully and it's exquisite, made of crystals, decorative stones and bone beads. The beads are meticulously carved with intricate designs, spirals, waves and crescent moons. Whoever made this clearly put a lot of effort into it. It really is a work of art by a skilled craftsman. Did you? You didn't make this, did you? No. He shakes his head. My father was the craftsman. 
He made it. For my mother. Your mother? He nods. She wore it every day. Oh my gosh. This whole time I've been wearing something his father handcrafted for his mother. It's an heirloom? Like a family heirloom? I'm shocked. And you gave it to me? What the hell was he thinking? I gave it to you because Deke said human women like gifts. And this is the second most valuable thing in the world to me. Second? The honest confession squeezes a laugh from me. What's the first? You, my Mary. You are the first most valuable thing in the world to me. Chapter 13 I'm nearly vibrating with nervous excitement as I lead Mary back to our den, my hands covering her eyes. Her friends, Marla and Jeannie, visited earlier, and they spent all afternoon splashing in the freshwater spring. No peeking, I remind her, keeping my voice low and playful. She giggles, clearly intrigued by the surprise I have in store. When we reach the mouth of the cave, I position her just outside the entrance. Okay, you can open your eyes now. I drop my hands and Mary's mouth falls open, eyes going wide. I did my best to transform our humble abode into something special, something worthy of her. Wildflowers overflow from vases, bowls, baskets and containers everywhere, perfuming the space with their sweet fragrance. Near the far wall, there's now a large bed complete with a frame, mattress, pillows and quilts. I also managed to scrounge up a small table with two chairs and even a plush sofa. A proper stone fire pit with a stainless steel grate now replaces the previous pile of ashes and soot. But the crowning glory is the composting toilet tucked discreetly along the back wall behind a partition. Mary turns in a slow circle, taking it all in. Her eyes glisten when they meet mine again. Rex, it's beautiful. I can't believe you did all this. I shrug, fighting back a proud grin. I had help. Asa, Deke, Tavion, Zeb, they all pitched in gathering supplies from the village. But I wanted our den to feel like a home. A home worthy of you, my mate. Mary launches herself into my arms. I catch her easily, lifting her off her feet as her lips find mine in a passionate kiss. It's perfect, she murmurs against my mouth. You're perfect. My heart swells hearing those words pass her sweet lips. I carry her to the quilt-covered bed strewn with flower petals and lay her down gently, our mouths still joined hungrily. We kiss until we're both panting, hearts racing. When I pull back just enough to meet her gaze, a rush of nerves washes over me. I practice this in my head, but I want it to be perfect. I take her delicate hand in mine. Mary, my mate, will you do me the honor of accepting my claiming mark? I hold my breath, awaiting her answer. This moment means everything to me. Her answering smile dazzles brighter than the noonday sun. Yes, of course I will. A shout of pure joy bellows from my throat. Unable to resist any longer, I capture her lips once more. My hands roam her body boldly, worshipfully, stoking the fire between us. I want her burning, aching for my claiming as much as I ache to claim her. When Mary arches against me, rocking her hips up to meet mine, I know she's ready. In moments our clothes lie scattered across the floor. I kiss, lick, and suck a path down her soft body. Her skin is like rose petals beneath my lips. I lavish attention on her heavy breasts until her nipples peak tightly. Mary sighs my name, fisting her hands in my hair to hold me close. The encouragement fans my desire. I kiss lower, over the gentle swell of her stomach, before settling between her silky thighs. My tongue delves between her slick folds, lapping up her essence. Her answering cries are the sweetest music. My cock is granite, bobbing impatiently. But not yet. I want my Mary utterly desperate for me first. Only when my mate is quaking and pleading breathlessly for more do I relent. I kiss back up her body until we're face to face once more. Please, Rex. She pants, her pupils dilated with lust. Locking my gaze with hers, I line my cock up at her slick entrance. We both groan as I push forward, sheathing myself in her sweet pussy. Nothing has ever felt so right as joining with my mate this way. As I move inside her, I pour all my adoration into each deep stroke. Her nails rake down my back, urging me onward, harder, faster, until we're both racing toward the peak. I sweep her hair aside, exposing the tender juncture of her neck and shoulder. Holding her gaze, I let my canines lengthen. Then I strike, piercing her delicate skin. 
Barry cries out, nails digging into my shoulders. I vaguely taste the metallic tang of her blood on my tongue as my cock pulses and erupts inside her. As we come back down from the dizzying heights of pleasure, I lick over the mark attentively until it closes. Drawing back, I take in the sight of my claim. Mary is mine now and forever. A primal satisfaction surges hotly through my veins. I love you, my mate, I rasp, emotion tightening my voice. Mary answers with a sated smile. She pulls my head down for a long, slow kiss. I love you too, Rex. With everything in me. We kiss languidly as our pulses gradually return to normal. I roll to my side, pulling her into my arms. Mary sighs contentedly, nuzzling against my chest. Her warm body tucked trustingly next to mine. My eyes drift around our cozy den once more, gratitude in every pore of my being. This wonderful female at my side has given me so much, a home, a family, a future filled with hope. Thanks to her, for the first time in forever, I feel like I'm truly alive. Epilogue Seven months later I walk through the village hand in hand with Rex, smiling and waving at everyone we pass. It's still so surreal to me that this place is now my home, and these people are my family. After Rex marked me, making me his mate for life, word spread quickly. When we come into town, which we do about once a week or so, pack mates go out of their way to come up to us and say hello. We're both greeted with smiles, hugs, and congratulations. They fully welcomed not only Rex but me into their tight-knit community. My new family is so much kinder, more welcoming, and far more supportive than Jehovah's Flock and Prudence and Gerald Baker ever were. And with Marla and Jeannie at my side, offering friendship and humor, I love being a part of the pack. Rex squeezes my hand, bringing my attention back to him. His amber eyes glow with warmth. What are you thinking about, my Mary? Just how lucky I am, I tell him honestly. Rex stops walking and pulls me into his arms. I melt against his muscular chest, as his lips capture mine in a dizzying kiss. When we finally come up for air, Rex rests his forehead against mine. His large hand drifts down to caress my swollen belly. I'm six months along now, and our little boy is strong and healthy according to Constance, the pack midwife. Rex kneels, lifting my shirt to place a tender kiss on my bare skin. Hello, pup. He rumbles. Your dad can't wait to meet you. My heart clenches with joy. Who knew when I signed on for the BFB program that I would gain so much, a home, a new family, the love of my life, and now the impending birth of my first child. Rex's glowing gaze is full of adoration. Come, my mate. Let's go home. Home. Our cozy den in the woods has truly become a sanctuary for us both. As Rex and I walk hand in hand back to our little slice of paradise, I send up a prayer of gratitude. To the moon goddess. We hope you have enjoyed this computer-generated audio production of Wolf's Prize. To ensure these authors are able to bring you more free content, please support them by subscribing to this channel. The next book in this series is Wolf's Faded.